The reading for this morning's lesson comes from 1 John chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. 1 John 2, 26 and 27. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Good morning. We are indeed glad that you are here. Thank you for coming to hear a portion of God's Word. Worship Him, hopefully in spirit and in truth. That's our aim. And we always want people to be invited to check their scriptures and make sure that we're doing things according to God's will. And if not, to question us about it because we want to be in alignment with God's will. That's always the case. It might be a little more the case this morning that I want you to check the things that I've said this morning because I've forgotten my glasses and I don't know what I'm looking at exactly but I hope that I can do stand far enough back from the Bible to see it and be able to preach some things to you that might be helpful in our study in first John chapter first John we're in chapter 2 starting at verse 26 where Brian has read for us so well these things I have written to you concerning those who try to seduce you the King James Version says other versions say deceive you there are things that we don't like in life there are many traits that make us different there are many characteristics that separate us from one another but I think that we all might have one common trait and that is that we don't like anybody lying to us when someone is lying to us we take offense at that and, we, and rightly so we might take offense that they think that our intelligence is low enough that we would believe that lie we might take offense that they think lowly of us to not share with us a saving truth because truth indeed saves and sets people free according to Jesus in John 8 verse 32 we are very offended when people lie to us but the trouble is sometimes we don't know we're being lied to. Sometimes people pass it off so well, people pass it off so slickly, people pass it off so smoothly that we don't know that it's happening. Religiously speaking, Paul said in Romans chapter 16 verses 17 and 18, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. People deceive people religiously. Peter spoke of them in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 3 he said by covetousness they exploit you with deceptive words. In verse 2 right before that he spoke of how they would deceive people and the way of truth would be blasphemed. Now sometimes to be fair some people are speaking falsehoods to us and don't even realize they're speaking falsehoods to us. They fall into the category of those who are deceived. There are two categories in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 13 by which the world grows worse and worse. In the last days the world will grow worse and worse. There'll be imposters and so forth. Deceiving and being deceived. Some people are just lying outright. And some people are lying and don't realize that they're lying. Some people are being told lies and don't realize that they're being told lies. In every field, there's a, there are a whole bunch of lies that guide mankind. Scientifically, there are a whole bunch of lies that guide the field nowadays with the theory, the disproven theory of evolution. Anthropologically, there are a whole lot of lies that guide the field of study. Philosoph philosophically, there are a whole lot of lies that guide the field of study. And religiously, a whole lot of lies guide people in a wrong direction. I suppose we ought not be surprised at that. Maybe we look backward on days and forget things that were wrong and remember things that were right. Doesn't seem like it always was that way. But it probably always was that way because the Bible teaches that the God of this age is Satan. The God of this world, the God of this age, this particular earth, this particular time period, this time that we have between the expanses of eternity on either side when God created time. Since Adam and Eve took of the forbidden fruit and brought the knowledge of good and evil into the world, we choose sin and there is sin and there are lies that God's in. And the God of this age has power now. He's still on God's leash, but the God of this age, the prince of the 
power of the air, Ephesians 2 verse 2, the ruler of this world, John 12 verse 31, has some power. And John chapter 8 verse 44 reminds us, as we stated last week, that he is a liar. He can do nothing but lie. He lies and kills. That's all he is ever going to be about. So we're guided by lies. Well, John wrote these things in 1 John concerning those who would try to deceive them. As you might guess, we can go on and on forever talking about lies that the world believes right now in every simple form and place, but I'm going to, for the sake of time and for the sake of uh, sermonic integrity, confine ourselves to the lies that are addressed here in this text. One ancient that still has ramifications and one more modern. The first lie that is addressed in this text is that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. You remember from studies a few weeks earlier up in verses 18 through 23 you've heard that Antichrist is coming but now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour and who is Antichrist? He who denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son is Antichrist. Essentially, extrapolating from that and extrapolating from the rest of the scriptures, anyone who is against Christ is Antichrist. There is not one particular person at the end of the ages that's going to fill that bill as one particular evil demonic person. It's anybody who's against Christ. That was one lie that John had to deal with here. And it grew out of that lie, as we've already said, bear with me for review, that lie of Gnosticism, that you could have some sort of intellectual capability above other Christians to where you knew things that other Christians didn't know. And basically that knowledge that you had that separated you and made you elite was this, that spirit was good and flesh was evil, so even if you were doing evil fleshly things, you were right with God. That was a lie. And that's what he's trying to get people to understand here. So these Christians had other people that would come in and teach them things from this direction and that direction, telling them, no, no, no. These apostles, they taught you some simple things, but we have the real intellectual things. These apostles taught you to behave, but we have the real intellectual things. These apostles taught you against the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, lewdness, uncleanness, covetousness, lasciviousness, uh, all these things. These apostles taught you against that, but you don't have to worry about that because we have the intellectual things that we're right with God, even though we participate in that sort of thing. Well, that was one ancient lie, but it's a lie that still permeates today. People, what are, what are the, largest, the largest attendances at any kind of place that calls themselves some kind of church are where those preachers tell people that the grace of God covers all no matter what you do and Jesus empathizes and Jesus tolerates and you don't have any need to repent because there's the grace of God. That's going to draw people in. Jesus said it would. But that's not what the Bible teaches. I don't mean to be unkind to anybody or, in, or question anyone's sincerity directly I do know that there are both types of people in the world, deceivers and those who are deceived, but I don't know which ones they are when I first meet them. But I'll tell you, the Bible teaches that the simple truths that the apostles taught by the revelation of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit are the simple truths that simply need obeyed. Now he goes on in this passage, verse 27 is one of the hardest verses to memorize that I think I've ever tried to memorize and I can't seem to get it. Verse 27 seems to bounce back and forth between different thoughts. But I think when you go over and over it again, you're going to see something real simple about it. Up in verse 20 of this chapter, he spoke about an anointing. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and know all things. Now we tried to delineate last week. That doesn't mean that he's telling these Christians they know everything there is to know. That doesn't mean that he's telling them they know everything scientifically, that they know everything historically, they know everything sociologically, they know everything biblically, they know everything religiously. No. They know all things concerning what these false teachers are trying to teach. They know all things concerning what these antichrists are trying to teach. They know enough to rebuke these antichrists with what they've already received from the apostles, which he calls here, symbolically speaking, an anointing. Well, he comes back to that anointing in verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from him 
abides in you. That is what we've already taught you abides in you. And you need to let that abide in you. You need to keep that abiding in you and not be distracted by these other things that they're teaching. That's what he's going to say. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you and you do not need that anyone teach you. He's not telling Christians they don't need to grow. Other places in scripture tell us we need to grow. Grow in grace and knowledge. He's not telling Christians they don't need to expand their knowledge. In the book of Hebrews they are, they are defamed. They are insulted by the apostolic writer or whoever it was. The Holy Spirit for not growing. He's not telling them that they don't need to be taught anything. What he's saying is these false teachers don't need to teach you anything. You already know what you need to know about this subject. And when they come to you with their high-minded, intelligentsia, elitist sort of doctrines that tell you, tell you that you can rise above all of the behavior, do whatever behavior you want to do and still be right with God, you don't need them to teach you that. You have an anointing from the Holy One that teaches you differently. But you have an anointing which you have received, which abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, that's back to a reference verse 20, all things concerning this doctrine, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it had taught you, you can almost see John preaching there, one, two, three. It's true, it's not a lie, just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. You know that it's right. You'll abide in him. And now, little children, he, he begs them, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know these things, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Not the person who says, I don't need to practice righteousness. That was the ancient false doctrine. That's the modern false doctrine. Not the person that says, I don't need to practice righteousness because my righteousness is given to me from heaven and I don't need to follow, I don't need to worry about those lists in the Bible, those things that are wrong. I don't need to worry about adultery. I don't need to worry about fornication. I don't need to worry about drunkenness. I don't worry, need to worry about drug abuse. I don't need to worry about treating my neighbor kindly. That's what these Gnostics were teaching. You're still right with God even if you do all those things. And John uses every language tool in the book that he has to tell them that's not right. The anointing that you have teaches you that's not right. And in this age, the anointing that you have is simply the knowledge of the scriptures. You can read that that's not right. You can check this blinded preacher this morning that doesn't have his glasses and see that that's not right. You can check the scriptures and see when people tell you that, that that is not right. Everyone knows that Jesus Christ is righteous. And he calls us to follow him in that righteousness. Everybody will go to John chapter 8. Well, he was kind to the woman who was caught in adultery. Yes, and don't forget the last words he said to her. Go and sin no more. Well, that's the ancient lie. There's a modern lie that comes out of this text a little bit earlier that I want to address now. If you go up to verse 19, you'll see it. They, that is these antichrists, went out from us, but they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would have continued with us. But now they went out from us that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. Now that's one of those confusing back and forth sentences too. Let me tell you how it's used by people, by teachers today. There are those teachers out there who say that once a person is saved, he could never be lost. No matter what he did, no matter what he does, he can never be lost. You're in Christ's hand. They get this primarily from passages that they take out of context. For example, in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 31, Jesus is talking. He's still using the sheepfold analogy. He's the good shepherd. His sheep follow him. He knows their voice. I'm the good shepherd. I, I know my sheep. They follow my voice, he says in verse 27. And in verse 28, he says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hands. Then he goes to the Father. And my Father, who is greater than all, gives them eternal life and neither shall anyone snatch them out of my father's hand the point he's making is in verse 30 I and my father are one no one's going to take my sheep from me Jesus says 
Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39 is often used in that connection as well. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things that are in heaven or things below are going to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I forgot the exact quote. But they use that quote to say that we'll never be separated from the love of God to say that we could never be lost once we're saved. So, a lot of people will teach that once you're saved and how you're saved, that's another whole different lesson. But let's assume they're even using the Bible plan of salvation, which is that a person would believe in Christ as the Son of God, repent of sins, confess Christ as the Son of God, be baptized for the remission of sins. They would say by their doctrine that at that point, there is nothing that you could possibly do to separate yourself from salvation in Christ. Now, turn to a couple other passages before we go on. 2 Peter chapter 2 is probably the most strong and many of you may have it memorized. Verse 20. He's speaking about those who have escaped the corruption of the world through lust. For if after they have escaped the, corrupt, the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end for them is worse than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way way of righteousness than to have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a pig having washed to his wallowing in the mire. Do you see what he's saying there? There were people who had escaped the corruptions of the world, but if they go back to the corruptions of the world, it's worse for them than if they'd never come to Christ and start with. In other words, yes, there are degrees of punishment in hell. It's worse for them than if they'd never started. They would, have, they would be people who have some sort of regret, some sort of circumstance in the afterlife that would make it worse for them than if they had never started Christianity to start with. But do you see what he's saying? They escaped the corruptions of the world. They went back to them. They weren't once saved and then always saved. Now that's a pretty good argument to make against somebody. Matter of fact, this argument against once saved, always saved, one person, one of our faculty members up at the school has told me, you could let your Bible fall open to any page in the New Testament and disprove that doctrine, but I'm only, I'm only going to look at a couple of passages this morning. Well, that once saved, always saved doctrine then is disproved by that 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, if you just take it on face value. But then these people say this. Here's the counter. They say, once we're saved, we're always saved. We'll retort, but what about this that says, if you go back after being away from the world, it's worse for you. And they'll say, well, wait a minute. Those people who go back. Now, we might ask them. We'll say to these people, you mean to tell me that if a person is baptized into Christ and then goes on a murdering spree, he's not lost? You mean to tell me that if a person is, baptized, if a person is saved, counted saved with God, and then commits adultery on his wife with a thousand other women that he's not lost? And what they'll say to that comes out of 1 John 2, 19. They'll say, well, they were never really converted to start with. And they think then that they have answered your question. They use verse 19 about these antichrists. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But now they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. And they say, see, these people left Christianity because they were never really Christians to begin with. Well, first of all, let me answer that he's talking about a limited situation in a limited context here about these antichrists. They were part of the church. They acted like part of the church. They seemed like part of the church. They never really were part of it. They went out and became antichrists. But that doesn't negate all these other scriptures in the Bible. What about Philippians chapter 2 verse 16? Where Paul says, I was holding fast the word of life. I was hoping that you were holding fast the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I had not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul was worried there in Philippians 2.16 and Galatians 4.11 and other places that his work among people might have been in vain. But was it? Not if they're faithful. How could his work be in vain if they became unfaithful? 
if they left Christ, if they were lost after they were saved. But now please look at 2 Peter again. I want to ask this question. Were the people about whom Peter was speaking, were they really Christians or were they just fake Christians that were then lost? Were these meeting the description of these false teachers who say, well, if anybody falls away, they weren't really faithful Christians to start with. Well, read verse 20 again. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? They escaped the pollutions of the world. They were done with the pollutions of the world. He doesn't say they act like they escaped the pollutions of the world. He does not say they pretended like they escaped the pollutions of the world. They escaped the pollutions of the world. Doesn't that point to the fact that they were real, solid Christians at one point? And then look up in verses 18 and 19. He's speaking of false teachers in verse 18 when he starts as the subject and then he moves on. For when they, that is those false teachers, speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. They're alluring people. And who are they alluring? Those who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Everybody in the world is those who live in error. They've escaped that. They've become partakers of the divine nature. Godliness, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 and following. They've become partakers of that. But these false teachers come and allure those who have actually escaped. Now, I'm not going to argue with the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to say, well, these people must not have actually escaped or they couldn't be going back to the world. I'm not going to do that. The evidence is that they were actual real Christians, but they were in danger of being led away by their negligence, by false teachers, by something. And then consider the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is all about people that were going to maybe fall away someday. He tells them they need to give more earnest heed to the things they'd heard lest they drift away. He tells them they need to beware lest they are taken away and by neglect. He tells them they need to fear lest they not enter the rest of God. But the book in chapter 10 betrays that when they first became Christians, they were really strong. Recall the days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you became a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became a companion of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully, joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. When they first started, they would let people take their stuff because they were Christians and they'd be glad about it. Were they not real Christians? And then look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5. Paul says to these people whom he loves so much, for, these re for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. Paul says I, he was in Corinth at the time, we believe, and he wrote back to the Thessalonians, said, I sent Timothy so that he could bring word about your faith because I was afraid the tempter had tempted you and pulled you away. I was afraid our labor would be in vain. The tempter would tempt you. The devil's after Christians. He's not after the world. He's, he's already got them. He's after Christians. Well, let's ask the question, were these Thessalonian Christians real Christians? Or were they the kind of fake Christians that these people say would fall away? Well, they weren't really converted to start with. Well, look back at chapter 1 and see the several descriptions that Paul makes of these Thessalonian Christians. He says in verses 2 and 3, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Those are more intense words the farther you go. Your work of faith turned into your labor of love. It got hard, but you kept going. That turned into your patience of hope. It got harder, but you kept going. Were they not really truly converted? Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Your election by God and you're saying they were not really truly converted? 
And then verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. And you know what kind of men we were among you for your sakes. And then verse 6, And you became followers of us and of the Lord in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. You were followers of us. You were followers of the apostles. You know how we came in integrity. You know how we came in truth. You know how we came without error, without uncleanness, without deceit. And you became followers of us. Now were they truly converted? It sure sounds like they were, doesn't it? And they became followers of us and of the Lord in much affliction. They suffered for it. Were they truly followers of the Lord? And then in verse 6 he says, You became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. They were exemplary, they were exemplary Christians. Verse 8, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. Paul says, You've done such a good job evangelizing, we can take the day off. Were they not really Christians? For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He compliments them. You were worshiping idols, then you worshiped and served the true God. Does he mean, was, was Paul deceived? Was the Holy Spirit deceived and in inspiring Paul to write these words? That these people were not really Christians because Paul was worried about them being tempted by the tempter? So if you can be worried about them falling away, then... They must not have been real Christians. Do these sound like not real Christians to you? No. They were real Christians. But Paul was worried that they would fall away. So, back in 1 John chapter 2, there's a balance to be had. If we could concede this, that once a person becomes a Christian, it is possible for that person to fall away then we have an extreme to which we might go. There's an extreme that might say, I have to be scared and in dire fear every moment of my life that if I dare mess up once accidentally, that I'm going to be lost eternally. That's one extreme. The other extreme is what we've been addressing this whole time. That is that you could never at all be lost. There's a middle ground that's perfectly biblical and perfectly acceptable. It's discussed here in verse 28 for one place in a verse I kind of glossed over a moment ago on purpose so that we could come back to it now. He says, and now little children abide in him. You have the anointing, you have what you need, you have the knowledge of God. Abide in him. You stay with him. You would behave like he wants you to behave. Abide in him that when he appears, he'll come back for his second coming, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. There's a middle ground, you see. It's been taught since 1 John chapter 1. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. Well, well what does that mean? It means that I know I'm not going to be perfect if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I know that I'm not going to be perfect but I can still trust in His grace to cover me if I've been doing my best and He knows my heart if I've been doing my best or not. That disallows the extreme that I have to be so fearful and anxious and on edge all the time. And it also disallows the extreme that I feel like I could never ever be lost no matter what I did. It's the middle ground that says, if He's righteous, I need to be righteous. And then if I'm doing my best to walk righteously, I can look forward to Him returning. I can be eager for His appearance. I can hope He comes today to take me home to heaven. And when our loved ones die, we don't have to sorrow as others who have no hope, Paul said in 4, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Well, if it was true that we had to fear every moment and we never, ever, ever, ever knew, then Paul couldn't have written those words in 1 Thessalonians 4 because we'd not know anything about our loved ones. We couldn't have any confidence whatsoever. But we can have some confidence. And there's the beauty of the grace of God. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, Romans 6 verses 1 and 2, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? 
We're, so we're supposed to present our members as instruments of righteousness to God, not as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But there's real practical trouble in the world today and in the church. And the real practical trouble that I see that sometimes transcends both together is that people are getting hard of heart. People are getting so hard of heart that they don't have any consciousness of their sins. Maybe they've never been told that something's wrong. But then sometimes when they're told something's wrong and they're shown it in the scripture, they go on without caring. There's no remorse. There's no feeling badly that we've hurt the Savior. There's a new hymn that is sung. By, hint, by new, I mean probably 20 years old. Can he still feel the nails every time I fail? Can he hear the crowd cry crucify again? Now, literally speaking, no. He's already felt the nails and he's already died on the cross. But you see what the song does through the image of poetry and the added emotional element of singing is asks us to be a little bit sensitive about our sins. Who killed Jesus? Well, some people say, well, the Jews killed Jesus. And the Jews will say, no, the Gentiles killed Jesus. And the truth is, as you know, we all killed Jesus because he died for our sins. We need a little more sensitivity to that. We need a little more sensitivity to it sometimes from, from people in the church. Because this practicing of righteousness is a continual thing. How often do we practice righteousness? How often do we allow ourselves slip in sin? Do we really care? Am I really concerned about that? Am I really concerned about learning and growing? Am I really concerned about my life for Him? There might be Christians who are very much in danger of being tempted by the tempter so that they fall back into a position where it's going to be worse for them in the end than it was in the beginning. Oh dear Christians, if you started the Christian walk and you've started and you've gone through some suffering, some persecution, maybe some family's been against you, maybe some people been against you, maybe it's been 20 years down the road, maybe it's been 30 years down the road, maybe it's been 40 years down the road, don't let the tempter get you. He still can. And it'll be sneaky. It'll be subtle. He'll just sneak up on you. And dear world, if we could ever get the world to listen to such a lesson, don't think that we can continue in sin and have grace abound. Don't think that we can continue in our affairs, in our immorality, in our drunkenness, in our wrongdoings, in our covetousness, in our greed, in our lack of in our oppression of the poor. Don't think that we can continue in those things and say, I'm right with God. Now Jesus was pretty stern about things like those. He's stern, but he's loving. He's the perfect mix of everything that is divine, justice and mercy. He gives us that justice if we rebuke his mercy. And we rebuke his mercy when we refuse to change for him. We want him to change to our will. We want to make God in our image instead of letting God make us in his image and then us conforming to the image of Christ with the new birth that he's provided for us. Now Christians, if you're starting to fall away, work harder, pray harder, study more, be with Christians more. Those are the answers. And non-Christians, if you've never become a Christian, don't wait. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Then you'll be a part of those people that have escaped those who lived in error. And you can be a part of those people who eagerly wait for the end of the world so that you can be in a sinless place where there is no pain or sorrow. This morning, if we could baptize you into Christ, I pray for you and with you, would you please come as we stand and sing.